school processes. These are some responses to a set of questions that seem to come up for those who are new to the sociology of education, particularly as it applies to the in-school factors or school processes arguments. First of all, there's the question about perspective. We know there are many perspectives in sociology. The one most commonly associated with in-school factors is symbolic interactionism. This is an approach that's based on the following ideas. Firstly, human beings act towards things on the basis of the meanings they have. If we all agree that a clown is a scary and terrifying thing, then it has an entirely different meaning and we will deal with it in an entirely different way to if we think of it as something that is funny and likely to make us all laugh. Same thing's true with school. Individuals will try harder at school when school means something they can succeed at. The meanings of things is derived from their social interaction. If we all come together and agree that school is rubbish, we will treat school as rubbish and we will reaffirm that belief for one another. Meanings are handled and modified through an interpretive process. People change their minds about the meanings of things, but they only do it in a social context. If you're put in a group where everybody says school is rubbish and no good for you, it's very hard for you to resist that dominant meaning. If you're taken from that group and put somewhere where lots of people seem to think that it's really valuable, you might at first cling to your older ideas and your older norms of behaviour, but very rapidly, because you're a social animal, you'll change the way you behave and you'll slowly begin to change what you believe. Positional theory. The guy in the line drawing here is Pierre Bourdieu. He theorises that there are differences in class position and these change the way we do at school. He argues that we occupy a position within our classes which he calls a fraction. He says we all know what fraction we belong to, but we don't really understand the difference between the separate classes. It's like this. My grandmother knew she was better than two doors down because her doorstep was swept properly and her linen was whiter than white. But she didn't understand, not properly, the difference between her and, for example, the family doctor, who she perceived to be a quality person. She knew he was better, but she didn't know how or why. She didn't understand the difference between her working class and his middle class, but she did really understand the difference between her fraction and her nearest neighbour's fraction. Material deprivation is just a fancy word for poverty. Really, it comes in two sorts. For the purposes of educational explanation, we don't need to worry too much about this unless we were thinking about different educational systems around the world. But the two sorts of material deprivation are relative and absolute. Absolute material deprivation or absolute poverty is just not having enough. Not having enough for whatever the job is at hand. You could live in absolute material deprivation of the necessities of life, in which case you'd be starving. You can live in absolute material deprivation of the necessities for learning, in which case you're doomed not to achieve academic success. Relative deprivation is different. Relative deprivation is not having as much as the average or some other point within the rest of society. If you perceive yourself to be worse off in some way, you are relatively deprived. Whether it's absolute or relative, you will have these kinds of material differences. So if the whole of the population is relatively well off, those who are relatively poorly off will have worse diets and concentration spans will be affected. They'll be under increased pressure to make an economic contribution at home. That might be in terms of part-time work or looking after the kids whilst the parents do work. There will also be, relatively, a lack of material resources. Not as many books, not as good a computer system, less space in which to do your own studies, maybe even something as simple as the absence of a flat, broad working surface to do your homework on. Not every house has a dining room table. And then there will be longer and more frequent periods of absence due to ill health and truancy, 
We know that poverty is correlated with poorer health outcomes, and we also know we can see why parents in materially deprived circumstances will have less time to spend dealing with truancy and poor attendance issues on the parts of their children. Cultural capital comes again from our friend Mr Bourdieu, who we saw before. He invented the idea of cultural capital in order to explain how forms of knowledge, skill and education combine with higher expectations of our parents and teachers to give some individuals a higher status in society. Cultural capital isn't necessarily the same thing as having qualifications. In fact, it's best illustrated if you don't think about qualifications. Imagine a situation where people coming out of A-levels have the same qualifications, three sets of A's or whatever, and they both apply to the same university and they both want to get onto the same course with the same entry criteria. Now the university admissions people have to distinguish between the two. University people tend to come from a certain class fraction. They come from the middle classes typically. They were educated and went on to university themselves and they are by nature going to feel more fellowship, more community with those who share their same culture, their same sets of values and beliefs. If your parents and your teachers gave you access to that culture, under those circumstances you will get on better. The children who come from grammar schools and middle class backgrounds do better in university not just because they have better A-levels, very often they don't need better A-levels, they do better because they can fit in well. So, in terms of cultural capital, parents provide children with capital and this shapes their attitudes and knowledge and makes them more able to access the education system, not just at university but at school compulsory sector as well. Mr Bernstein he gives us two key concepts in, in school processes. He noticed that when people speak from different class backgrounds, they speak a different set of codes. First of all, there is the elaborated code of the middle classes. Middle class people tend to speak in complete sentences, and you can work out what they're on about, even if you're not there, if it was heard afterwards or reported to you. Because it's complete sentences, you don't need to see the image in order to understand what's going on. If middle class dad tells middle class son, don't kick your daughter and your sister under the table, ask her to move if you haven't got enough room, we can work out pretty much what's going on there. Working class dad might well just shout, Oi, stop that! You couldn't tell from that expression what was going on, what was being objected to. The elaborated code gives us complete sentences and we don't need contexts. The restricted code is richer, more economical, but we need to be there to understand what's going on. It's where language is used more like an index, pointing, to the, pointing the hearer at a lot more information that remains unsaid. Labelling is another in-school process that's very often poorly articulated. It requires us to use some aspect of a person's behaviour or their history to identify them on a permanent basis. If we habitually refer to somebody as a criminal when they committed a crime once, say when they were 16, we're labelling them. Uh, when I was at school, a student in class with me was routinely referred to as deaf, daft and stupid because on one occasion he'd had an ear infection and couldn't hear the instructions the teacher gave him. But because that one occasion was constantly brought back up and constantly reinforced as what that person was like, they began to acquire the label. People began to refer to them as deaf, daft and stupid, not able to make progress. Their outcomes at school were adversely affected as a consequence. Self-fulfilling prophecy is the, the extension of the labelling process. In the beginning you start off with a false definition of the situation which causes a new behaviour making the original false idea come true. You pick your student, you call them deaf, daft and stupid, you constantly reinforce the label to them, you get other people to join in with that, and eventually the child begins to say, you know what, it really doesn't matter what I do, so I might as well at least behave the way they expect me to, they don't give me as hard a time. 
Some educational theorists and teachers have argued that this notion of self-fulfilling prophecy and labelling could be used to counteract the effect that if you labelled students as able and uh, intelligent and had high expectations of them, you ought to be able to see a positive self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, originally when the idea was put forward, this was not something that was proposed. Academic talent, intelligence, ability was seen as innate, something that you couldn't build on by raising expectations or spending money. You had so much ability, it could be wasted, it could be directed into the wrong kinds of things by labelling and self-fulfilling prophecy, but you couldn't make more of it that way. Subsequently, there have been academic theorists who've said, no, 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 you, you, can, you can make somebody an academic by putting the right amount of resources into them and making the correct expectations of them. You can't decide which side of that argument you fall on on the basis of the argument itself. There are broader questions here, whether or not you believe that there is an innate human nature or innate human potential. Or maybe you think that human abilities and potential are a consequence of the context in which they occur. Maybe if we'd taken Leonardo da Vinci and forced him to live as a street urchin, he wouldn't have seemed all that bright. Now, back to some more technical matters. There's a difference between banding, or what we would call setting in this country normally, and streaming. Banding or setting is when students are placed in different ability groups for individual subjects. Um, you might be considered to be a very able English person, but not really very good at, say, physics. Or you could be a brilliant PE person, but no good at modern foreign languages. The alternative position is streaming. This is where we take a student's ability in a limited number of fields to be an indicator of how well they'll do in all academic disciplines. The clearest case of this in the UK is the 11 plus and the grammar system. You can only get into the elite specialist grammar schools if you pass the 11 plus exam. And the 11 plus exam tends to focus on a fairly limited range of skills. They tend to be very sort of about rational decision making things, mathematical skills, logic, reasoning. These are all valuable things, but there has been a considerable amount of discussion about how good they are at indicating whether or not you'll be any good at creative disciplines or uh, foreign languages or whether or not you'll have particularly talented sporting abilities. If you stream people, you tend to say, I've got uh, a limited stock of talent inside this person and if I encourage and promote it, it will be good for all areas of academic ability. On the other hand, if you set, you might say, well, the person has absolutely no musical talent whatsoever, but they're an absolute whiz when it comes to French. These are philosophically different positions. You can't decide between them on the basis of the argument alone. People come to this argument with an idea in their head. You either think that inside the person there is an innate amount of ability that can be wasted, or there's the opportunity to develop and create something in a person. Stephen Bell did research into these kinds of issues when he was looking at Beachside Comprehensive. He concluded that streaming is often linked to social class. He argued that pupils from high social classes are likely to be streamed. He also argued that higher streamed pupils are encouraged to think of themselves as potentially successful. They're warmed up for academic courses like A-levels and that lower streamed pupils are cooled out and encouraged to follow less academic and more vocational courses, leading to lower social status occupations and reduced earning potential. I think we can see here how all of the ideas combine together. If you are materially deprived, your children will have fewer material opportunities to be successful at school. You will have less time to devote to raising your expectations of them. They will be then streamed into a lower ability set or a lower ability group and encouraged to take non-academic vocational qualifications leading to occupations with lower uh, material outcomes, poverty. And so the education system is conservative with respect to social class.